again um can't believe when we started these eight weeks ago or whatever it was um i thought we'd do one or two of them and um here we are um keeping going with the fun times on video um good news is um the world in california and probably where you are is uh starting to open up a little bit mm -hmm. um, sure. yeah carrie um has been uh, on site more often, which is cool. And uh, Tom and uh, Joseph are, uh, and the whole Taste Room team um, is getting ready to welcome me back. So that's really exciting. They've um, ordered new furniture, moved all the fabric stuff away so that, that the things that can't be wiped down easily with sanitizer. Um, and uh, so we're, we're recreating the tasting spaces. So it's kind of fun. You'll get to yeah. see some new, 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 new areas, new, new opportunities to explore what Turnbull's about on your visit. Um, and that's about to, we're just, we're, we'll be ready to go um, in a very safe and uh, pragmatic and, and clean way um, when the state of California, which has done a great job keeping everybody safe out here, um, when uh, when we get the, the go word, um, we're hoping to be ready to, to um, service that appropriately. And so, when we're ready too, that's an important point. Yeah. No, because if we're not feeling we're ready as a staff and in terms of the equipment that we have to be as hygienic and safe as possible, we will open up when we feel ready. So yeah. Napa wineries or Napa restaurants. Napa restaurants are know. open again. Um, opening at their own pace, of course, is just like us. They want to open when they feel like it's appropriate uh, and safe. Um, but there are a few places that are opening up so yeah. if you if you're looking to come to Napa Valley and you feel like it's safe to do so and you feel comfortable doing it things could be opening up soon yeah and I you know I mean to be honest I, I, I'd be as a as a both a patron of local restaurants and um, obviously don't mind eating um, the um, you know I, I, I feel pretty comfortable to go to a taste room and, and many of you have been to the Turnbull tasting uh, spaces we have a lot of room and uh, some great outdoor spaces so we've got a lot of opportunity to to host you in a very safe and, and good way so it's it's kind of exciting the the seller team and myself have been here straight through and the vineyard team's been doing all the hard work in the vineyard it's been a, a busy season um and we've made actually good headway um 
although I, I love it when you're here, um, those uh, chance encounters where we get to meet up in the cellar and, and spend a couple minutes together. Turns out those add up. And so I've been, I've been much more efficient now that um, it's just me and, and, and the team here making wine. Um, but because of that, I'm, I'm, all, I'm getting caught up and um, I'm going to be able to be a little bit more available um, for um, hanging out with you in a socially distanced way mm -hmm. uh, when you come back. So that's going to be fun. Um, yeah, the, the seller's been been busy, and it's it's kind of fun to get this. To, you know, the one of the great things is the the family on Strimble, the Odells, um, have done just a gorgeous job of um, of both protecting our economy by continuing to employ all their frontline staff and also um, protecting their employees. Um, the idea being that that, um, that the, the same great staff that you have known and enjoyed um, are still fully employed and on the team. And uh, when you come back, you'll have a familiar face to welcome you back. And um, hopefully those familiar faces will, will be excited and, and know um, how great it is to work for a family that, that respects um, that work and uh, continues that. So that's, that's been kind of a, a beautiful thing. Um, you know, we um, were very fortunate that way. And, um, I, I, and it's very exciting. It's, it's nice for me to be able to tell uh, the vineyard team and the seller team also that uh, the family that they've worked for for decades is like doing the hard work to support the front of the house in this challenging time. And um, there's a lot of crossover, actually. Our seller master's um, wife and son both work in the front of the house. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a very close-knit family affair. And um, you, by extension, um, being our faithful followers and the people that are watching this and um, enjoying our wines um, near and far, um, you're like family to us. So um, it's really, um, you know, we've had um, a lot of people chime in on this thing and, and watch it and ask cool questions. We're expecting some good questions today. Mm -hmm. And um, that's what's keeping us going. So the, the, you know, the fuel in our tank is indeed your participation. If, if you weren't interested in what we're doing, then uh, we would have stopped these long ago. So thank you for doing that. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, I guess you can get into tasting, but just while we're on that note, um, maybe just go with a couple announcements. Um, as we might see a future of opening up soon, it could be next week, it could be in two weeks, it could be in a month, but while we're getting things ready here, we're going to slowly taper these tastings down a bit to uh, every other week. So in June, we will have two tastings. Next week, we will release a calendar um, of those two tastings, so you can kind of mark your calendars and get your sellers ready or whatever you need in, in place to make sure you can uh, watch those live with us. Um, so we'll keep a lookout for that. But um, next week, we do have our last May tasting. So that will make, I think, nine tastings in total we've done, since yeah. we, which is really weird to think about. It's a lot. Um, so next week, we're doing a barrel tasting where we're going to kind of pull some samples from some what? barrels. Oh, I should really say calendar, right? <laughs> I was just joking around with Carrie. Carrie does a great job of telling me what's coming up, and uh, and uh, I was just teasing. Her, so I know it's teasing. Um, but we will pull some barrel samples and kind of go into what that role of winemaking involved, which is barrel tasting and sampling, which is a huge. I mean, you just did it, uh, some barrel sampling today, so it's yeah, every day. A very big part of your job and kind of going into what that's about, and um, so we'll taste some wines that way. So really next week, open to any bottle of terminal, I think that would be pretty applicable to um, what we're tasting next week. We don't really know what we're yeah. tasting. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't, nice. Carrie's working in the blind here, I haven't, I haven't divulged what I've got in the works, but. Um, yeah, got some things. Yeah, well, uh, it'll be 2019, so it's okay. gonna be um, Young Wines. Um, we've just, uh, Solid Team and I, uh, that's the Royal Wine have been um, racking all the 2019s um, up to tank and back. And so um, it's pretty exciting. The wine, the vintage is spectacular um, with an exclamation point. And um, so we'll have those wines, um, you know, in two years from now, you'll get to taste those. Yeah. Um, but uh, Carrie and I and uh, Tom behind the camera will be uh, tasting those um, next week and uh, telling you about the excitement that we find in them. So that's next week's tasting. Um, and then just want to say thank you to Karen McNeil for hosting uh, Peter and kind of the wider team in that sense on a live tasting this past Tuesday. Uh, you can find that tasting on her Instagram or her Facebook page. Uh, and then actually next week, that just reminds me of another tasting with another kind of uh, voice of the, of, the, of the wine world, uh, Tom Highland. He's a writer for Forbes.com. That is taking place on next Wednesday on the 27th. 
Uh, we will send that Zoom login information uh, on an email to you uh, tomorrow and then kind of follow up next week. Um, Tom is hosting that, uh, tasting himself, so he will provide that login information so we can share it with you soon. Um, that's really it for me. So maybe we that's can cool. Thanks for the reminder. Get to the end. Yeah, do not forget about yeah. that. And it, it was, um, for those of you that caught the Karen tasting, that was really special. Um, we were joined by our fellow vintners over at Gargiulo and Nicola and Nicola Next Door, um, and they showed their wines. We showed our 2016 Fortuna Vineyard Cabernet, which was um, special wine. Mm-hmm. Um, all the wines are special, of course, and uh, that was um, put together with um, with Karen McNeil, who was um, such a great moderator and uh, kept me from talking too much um, in a good way. She's and, very good at that. Yeah, she's good at that. And um, and um, and then it was it was um, co-hosted by um, Oakville Vintners, um, which is um, wine growers, which um, is a trade group that, of all the grape growers in Oakville that helps um, talk about and promote Oakville. Um, and they've they've done a wonderful job um, helping the voice of Oakville reach a new audience. So that was um, really special, and we appreciate that. All right, so we've got uh, our yeah. meanest tasting today. Yeah, so um, I think what was what was officially announced is that we'd be tasting the 2010 Aminos, and um, which is a special wine that's right, right here in the middle. Um, and uh, I just bounced up to the the winemakers library, and I got the very last bottle, as far as I'm aware, at the winery ever in production. There's none for sale. Um, I, this is the last bottle I have in the library, um, wow. and. Um, and uh, so we've opened that, and then we have the 2016, which will be is that Tom is that releasing soon or released or uh, we are planning a summer release, so probably great. the next month. Okay, great. So and then we have a, a soon to come release of the 2016 Amenos uh, Cabernet, and so I thought we'd just taste all three of them. Um, yeah. The um, kind of exciting the 2007. So the Amenos Vineyard just like wind back yeah, a little bit. Of it's up in Calistoga. Um, we did a vineyard hike there a couple of years ago with some members yeah. and we did a barbecue a few years ago before that. Um, so some of you might have seen that in this vineyard, but it, um, as much as, as Oakville has a captivating grace and beauty and the sunlight so filtered in the morning and so blazing in the afternoon and there's a majesty of Oakville um, and the importance of Oakville in the Napa Valley, um, Calistoga is the sleeping giant. Um, mm-hmm. It is a magic gem. And if I um, if I don't say so, the um, the Amenos Vineyard is one of the most beautiful vineyards in the entire Napa Valley. And when the Odell family um, developed the, the vineyard in the late uh, 90s, they did such a beautiful job. Um, mm-hmm. So where it was at the time um, completely illegal and uh, probably encouraged to like bulldoze um, oak trees and, and uh, make way for more vineyards. Um, the Dell family chose to leave um, 100-year-old oaks um, with abandon. It's a 150-acre property, and there's 50 acres planted. So there's wide swaths, um, strewn throughout the vineyard of important um, trees. There's you know 50-foot-tall buckeyes and awesome oak trees and pines um, that you wouldn't believe. It's gorgeous. Um, and the vineyard actually was a sanctuary in the 2017 Tubbs fire. Um, wildlife, uh, both mammal and uh, plant, um, took took refuge uh, amongst the vineyard and uh, in its in in its uh, fire shadow, if you will. Yeah. Um, and so the, the the treescape around the vineyard is is scarred from that fire and and will be coming back over the coming centuries. Um, but um, many of the the trees that are going to create the acorns and the pine cones that will seed the future forest um, are the ones that were protected by the the vineyard. Which is, I think, interesting because well, this is another debate. The yeah. Pronunciation. Amenus, and I say Aminus, say Amenus. Amenus, it's probably the right, that is the right way. It's a Latin word for um, kind of this, this pleasant place. There's kind of this garden of Eden tone to it, but there's also kind of this darkly melodic um, so, undertone kind of in the pleasant place yeah. reference. It, it goes back to, um, the naming goes back to Latin poetry. Uh, it's akin to the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, a, you know, the um, there's meadow foam and flowers and deer bouncing around and, and uh, eagles soaring overhead and, and beautiful, beautiful trees and, um, you know, secret little glens and little streamlets. And it's a, it's a beautiful um, place that you'd want to visit. 
Um, the wines from Mamenos have a dark presence. There's a rich mid palate of um, dark cherries and, and, and plums that's uh, resonating. Um, there's texture and structure that, that reminds you of more difficult times, maybe. But um, there's a comedy, and then in, in the in the old Latin poetry, there's a there's a music that emanates from Amenos and um, calls you in. And uh, just like the Hotel California, um, mm -hmm. you can't leave. That would have been a perfect day. That would have been a good time. If only I had um, the Eagles on vinyl. Not like the hugest Eagles fan. No offense to any Eagles fans out there, but. Um, yeah, it's tough. Um, but if we, um, if that would have been actually a great intro or exit song, it would have been Hotel California. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I could have brought the um, Big Lebowski um, soundtrack. I do have that because we're fans of the movie. The soundtrack turns out to be kind of horrible, but the one gem on the soundtrack is um, Gypsy Kings doing Hotel California. Oh, that's cool. And that, that's actually a really cool song. Um, so maybe we'll have to bring that in on some future tasting. And we'll, it'll be, for those of you that are watching this one, you'll know it's an inside joke about Amenos, um, Hotel California, the, where you you, uh, you can't leave. Um, and so the, the, the song in, in the Latin poetry of Amenos um, draws you in and then you can't leave. Um, and so that hopefully these wines kind of um, roil that up. I, as much as the, the name is difficult to pronounce, I think it's very accurate to the place mm -hmm. in that it is such a beautiful place and it does have a darkness and brooding aspect to the mid palate. And it's something that you want to, that, that persists and you want to stay with and you want to drink more of. So the, the whole storyline of Amenos totally works. Um, it's a little bit awkward in that it's hard to pronounce and different people on the Trimble team will pronounce it differently. I probably pronounce it differently than everybody else. We probably pronounce it. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, I asked, uh, I have a friend um, that um, lives in Southern California and um, these, um, they, they, they work at, uh, one of them works at a, um, a church that um, does a service in London, and he's the yeah. choir director. And so I asked, um, I asked him, how do you pronounce this word, the O and the E intertwined? And, and he was like, well, in Latin, in, in church Latin, mm -hmm. which maybe is different than Latin Latin, um, it would be a menace. So I, I've gone, a menace. A menace. A menace. Yeah, so I've gone with that. Um, I don't know if that's actually accurate. Yeah, I, I, I didn't take Latin in, in school. I took, I took Russian, which turns out to not be that useful. <laughs> it could be useful in the future, but um, right yeah. now, not so useful. So um, anyways, on to the ones. Um, the um, 2007, and then it was um, my first vintage at Turnbull. Um, being a Cal State kid, I really um, – believe and believed that um, the Calistoga is so special. And this vineyard in the in the greaterness of Calistoga is a very special vineyard. It's up in the, the eastern, or I'm sorry, the western northmost corner of the Napa Valley. So um, close, the closest uh, producer would probably be Bennett Lane or Storybook Mountain. It's about equidistant from both of them. Yeah. Um, but it's it's um, it's hill, hill, hilltop, um, hillside, um, secret, secret um, verdant valley um, that's really tucked, tucked back in the hills. Um, and here, um, the 2017 vintage um, was a vintage that had such a small, the, the crop size was a little bit smaller than normal, um, but that wasn't because it, there were fewer clusters, it was because the berries were so small. So in 2007, um, to, due to reasons that we don't fathom, and uh, shouldn't question and um, have to celebrate. Um, the wines of 2007 were some of the best in the valley for, you know, that was the vintage of the decade, probably until 2010 came along. Mm -hmm. um, I think 2007, I think most vintners would tell you, was like the best thing that they'd seen since maybe 97. So it was a very important vintage. Um, and you could go for years to a restaurant, you know, in 2010, 11, um, nine, you, if you went to a restaurant and you ordered Napa Valley 2007 anything, it was going to be great. It didn't matter if the people had a, a swale behind the cottonwoods um, or hillbilly farming or loser winemaker, you could still make a good wine in 2007. Um, and this this is a result of an exceptional vineyard with great farming, with a lot of care and passion. Um, and that all shows. Um, yeah. It's a really special wine. Um, when I first opened it, I thought it was a little bit um, ripe and flat, but now that it's opened up, it's really opened up nicely. and I, I mean, I opened these wines, um, I know that we told you to open them like an hour ago, but um, Carrie and I, well, Carrie and I were working on um, the tasting notes for our new 2018 
Napa Valley Cabernet with our awesome uh, natural sales manager, Sean Crowley. Um, he's uh, sequestered down in Palm Springs. Uh, tough, tough nut for him. And um, the um, so we wrote the 2018 notes with him. Um, it's a totally special wine. We're super excited about it. So, you know, when you're out in the world and you see a bottle of 2000, probably 2017 Napa Cab right now would be in your local bottle shop or the restaurant that, that's um, doing takeout wine. That wine was Antonio Galloni's like top, top um, number one sub fifty dollar yeah. Cabernet in the world, um, which is awesome, and we're humbled by that. Um, Eighteen, I think, is actually a better wine. Um, super exciting, and that's yeah. going to be coming out um, in the next couple of months. It's a big takeaway from that tasting is it's it over delivers. Yeah, beyond. super over delivers. Yeah. So um, we were tasting that. And um, I forgot where I was going with this, but um, we didn't have ta- chance. Oh, to we didn't have a chance to open the wines. Thank you, Carrie. Um, I love the youthful wine that can remember um, the fragments. So um, good job. Thank you, Carrie. I can remember thirty seconds ago. Yeah. Glad I'm here. Tom can remember thirty seconds ago, which I think is like pretty awesome because I'm about five seconds ago is about it. Um, so, um, but the aromatics on this wine, having now been open for maybe a half hour. Uh, stunning. There's a mm-hmm. dark, resonant, um, berry potency to the wine. The um, dark cherries and plums that are succulent and ripe, but not overripe. There's not a lot of like drying um, fruit characteristics. It's kind of quite incredible considering it's a 13 year old wine. Mm-hmm. So you normally have a, like a lot of bottle age where you'd have tobacco leaf and and uh, different tertiary tones and the amount of like fresh fruit. It's actually pumping up out of the aromatics is, is kind of yeah. amazing. Um, it's it's very dense wine, and that that harkens back to the small berries from that vintage. So the the, the vines themselves, due to the weather pattern, that there was a, a, a low um, low amount of rain. I think we had like 50, 60 percent of normal rainfall. So similar to what we have in going into twenty twenty, um, and then the growing season was like um, pretty chill and even and normal, and then Labor Day really hot. Um, got the the sugars to pump up, which was nice because we needed we needed like something to happen to like kind of differentiate the the pack, um, and then the riper fruit we were able to bring into the winery and the slowpoke stuff we brought in later, and so we were able to pick everything at its perfect ripeness, and we made these very concentrated um, but succulent wines that aren't overripe um, because of that that growing pattern, um, and then that the smaller berries a lot of skin contact. So you have uh, in a small berry, red wine making is all about the geometry of the berry. Well, not all about it, but the concentration of flavors is all about it. Mm-hmm. And the size of the berry has a lot to do with how dense and compact the, the wine is. Um, smaller berries have more skin contact or more skin content mm-hmm. to volume of the interior of the berry. So go back to high school geometry. Um, small berries have uh, very little sugar water inside them in comparison to the amount of skin contact. And so when you ferment those wines, you get you just get more power, and that that yeah. totally shows up here. This is definitely the most powerful and intense of the three wines that we have: the yeah. seven, ten, and sixteen. Um, seven is um, lording over them with yeah. like so um, you, power. If you have a seven in your cellar. I'd say this is. It's time. It's time. Yeah, no, it's tasting great. I definitely don't, open it. You know, as you as as you date, just one more. Um, the tannins are already like totally fleshed out. You've got like, I mean, there is like nice um, texture and structure um, that rocks back and forth. And there's a lot of width and power and fruit lift. Um, it's really complete. I, I think as you age this more, the fruit power would either um, stay present and the texture and tannin would soften more mm-hmm. and become less interesting or the fruit power would like diminish and the texture and structure would like show up more. So I think Carrie's right. Um, it's a good time to open the seven if you've got one of them. I mean, not today, but in the next year or two. Um, but it, it tastes kind of fantastic. And I think yeah. it's, a, it's a nice precursor to the 10. So what we advertise that we'd be tasting. And hopefully some of you have this wine um, in your glasses. Yeah, aromatically, it's, it's really special. Um, yeah. it, where the opulence of like fruit power and that compact um, small cluster dynamic mm-hmm. so present in seven. Uh, I was Ten, watching Tom yeah. delicately reach for his yeah. glass, and then into I'm a delicate person. Yeah, <laughs> Tom's so delicate. Well, um, yeah, the um, the ten has this great spice box. It's yeah. much more complex aromatically. Instead of just being like throwing like overripe um, cherries and, and plums at you, um, this wine has these um, 
there's like tertiary layers of like tobacco, mm -hmm. uh, brown spices, the brioche, roasted almonds, but like fusing through all of that, like the sword, like um, jamming through all that is this like um, pinnacle of cherry and plum fruit. Yeah. So it's, a, it's very much the cousin of the seven. Um, so you can definitely feel a sense of place because um, all those other flavors I talked about are really barrel notes or bottle aging notes, but um, so special. The, the 10 vintage, of course, is magic for Turnbull. Um, it was our first 100 point wine, was the 2010 Fortuna Vineyard Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and the, um, they're just such great wines. The, the 10 vintage um, will go down as one of the great vintages of all time in Napa Valley. Um, the, the wine um, shows that tension. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it is tension and texture that make greatness. Um, the individual fruit tones or flavors don't matter so much, but it's about like how, how it feels. And the 10, the ten's engaging, even a, now as a 10 year old wine. Yes. And Tom, we have a couple bottles of this available. We do have 2010 in minutes in the library. Yeah. yeah. So Tom, Tom's it's on our library list yeah. for members. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the, the, um, the, the front of the house team has wisely stacked away 2010s knowing that, it was going to be something special in the future. So um, as members, um, you have access to this wine. If it's not something that you have right now, it's something that you should have, because um, this is this could be the wine that you're showing off at Christmas or Hanukkah um, this year, um, or Festivus or whatever you're into. This is, um, this, this wine is really special. Mm -hmm. um, you can also totally drink it on a Tuesday or a Thursday. We're drinking it on Thursday right now, and it goes just fine with Thursday. Um, this yeah, <laughs> this, is this is my Thursday. This my go-to Thursday one. It's a pretty solid Thursday one. Um, we yeah, are, really like you know, we are very blessed, and um, and I think many of you are also blessed and have the opportunity to um, find enjoyment in these difficult times. And mm -hmm. and um, and if we don't take advantage of enjoying things um, when other people can't, then we're doing them a disservice too. So um, not to feel. Um, bad about that. I yeah. think. Um, I think if this time tells us anything, it's just enjoy, enjoy what yeah. you got. I mean, there's, there's yeah. things that are changing every day. So G Gary Roll was asking about tannin quality between all three, but yeah. you know, tannins. The, there's a lot of explanation you do on what tannins are and yeah. then what they bring to a wine, whether it's a bad thing or a good mm -hmm. thing. Some people like to think about bad tannins. Yeah. So he was asking if it's consistent uh, across all three. I know we haven't gotten to the sixteen yet, mm -hmm. but you want to just talk a little bit about what that what is yeah. quality when it comes Thank, to Thanks for that question, Gary. Um, and hello to you and your family. Thank you for joining us again. Um, so I think I've, I've explained it before, and I was I touched on a little bit with uh, Karen's tasting on Tuesday. But um, tannin, which sounds like a scary thing or a bad thing, is a um, there's two. It's a X Y axis, and there's um, there's both quantity. So you can have little tannin or lots of tannin, and then there's quality, and you can have like fantastic creamy smooth tannin, and you can have like green ratty rustic tannin. Um, the worst wines have lots, like high quantity, lots of green tannin, right? And the best wines have high quantity, lots of creamy tannin. So like um, kind of cool thing is that um, certainly seven and 10 were very high quantity high quality tannins. I would say that 16 um, is a vintage that um, is less exceptional than 10 and seven in terms of its overall quality, it's super quality vintage, but seven and 10 were like magic unicorns and 16 is an exceptional child, mm -hmm. you know, it's, but it's not like, um, it's, it's not in the same pantheon of quality of vintage um, I think that our winemaking and our grape growing have improved. So actually my, my, my preference wines here are like the 10 and the 16 above the seven. Cause I think I and my team and my vineyard team have gotten better at our craft and more honed in on uh, restraint and place. Mm -hmm. And so the wines have improved over time. So um, the 16 is, is the equal of the 10 but not because the vintage in 16 was as good as 10, in my opinion. Right. Um, but the tannin bound, the, 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 the tannin structure, the vineyard um, does the same work. 
Um, and so as the, the tannins, like how, what, what's the difference between a green tannin and a creamy tannin has to do with like the ripening point of the fruit. And so that's a really farming terroir question. So the terroir gives you the potential, how you farm that terroir and when you pick the fruit before the fruit, the game ending moment before you can pick fruit in a good way, you're picking rotten fruit, let's say, um, that game of farming to picking intention to picking logistics, if you can swirl that up um, and, and get the right timing and you have the baseline of good terroir, then you can achieve creamy ripe tannins. And that's happened in all three of these wines. Um, if you somehow don't have the terroir to drain the soil or to give the, the vines the right um, structural, textural feeling, then it doesn't really matter where you pick the grapes. It's going to be crap anyways. But it, it, if you have that baseline, you could pick, you could farm wrongly so that your hand is forced to picking and not be able to pick at full ripeness. Then you might be picking in a less than ripe zone and you might have gritty, unripe, um, drying and austere tannins that aren't very pleasant. And then as a winemaker, you'd have to work hard to relegate those or rectify those. And in doing so, you ruin place and time. So um, it's a, that the the you know the the idea that the winemaker chooses the picking timing, and that instructs how good the wine is. That is instructed, of course, by how you how well you farmed, and and that is instructed by how the quality of the vineyard. So all those things swirl up since we're tasting the same vineyard place, um, and the team has been completely consistent across all three of these vineyards. Vintages. Yeah. Um, I, I led um, the same vineyard crew. Um, we did lose our great um, vineyard master, Jose Ortiz, um, after the 2010 vintage and before the 2016 vintage. Um, but Juan Toscano, who is our, our new vineyard manager, um, was part of the team as our second lieutenant um, under Jose for two decades before that. So the consistency um, is, is easy to find. Um, I don't think that Although Jose did a great job, and Juan is is um, is fantastic, I, I I love working with Juan. Um, I and their efforts are very important to the wine. Um, they both did such a good job that that that's fairly seamless in the yeah. in the bottle, and I don't think you'd notice. Um, but um, in 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 appreciation of them, not in deference to them. So um, the. Um, that hard work um, swirls up and becomes that tannin backbone. And mm -hmm. I think it's pretty consistent across the three wines. They, yeah. um, I did pull up the, the little blend percentages on the three wines. It's kind of interesting to, to me. Um, I don't dwell on this stuff very much. And, and Rob Smith, who's one of our tasting room um, stalwarts, who's been with Turnbull, he's the second longest tenured white guy, actually, at the Turnbull Winery. Um, he... Um, he knows every single blend percentage of every wine that I've ever made. Um, and he's an encyclopedia of that stuff. And I um, I couldn't tell you what I blended last week. Um, it's not true. But yeah, it's totally true. But um, he, um, I looked it up and uh, the set, the 2007 uh, Manos was 93% cab and 7% Le Grind. Interesting. Yeah, uh, the, the, technically the notes for the, the 07 say that the Le Grind was um, um, Malbec and Petit Bordeaux. Um, but um, remember back to the story about how um, the Bon Vivant, um in 2007, the the uh, Menace Vineyard had a block of um, Petit Bordeaux and Malbec, just like the Leopoldina Vineyard did, and it, they both turned out to be Le Grain. So um, I converted that number into a combination, uh, I think it was like 4% Petit Bordeaux, 3% uh, Malbec or something, but now I know, in retrospect, they were both Le Grain. So, um, that that leads a lot of that fruit power and succulents to the seven. Um, by um, the 2010 vintage, uh, it was 96 percent cab and four percent of grind. Um, and then it was after that year that we pulled out the um, Petit Pro, having found out that it was the grind. It was the only virus to, um, grapevines at the at the vineyard, and so we replanted that. Um, and the 16 then therefore is 100 percent cab. Um, so there's an evolution, um, almost a, 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 a straight line, mm -hmm. um, 93 cab, 96 cab, 100% cab, 
um, across them. And I actually think you can taste that too. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. The um, Legrine um, added um, a uh, fatter belly mm -hmm. to the wines. And um, in 16, where we've gone to 100% cab, um, the wine is um, more about sinew and focus, and it's less buttressed by fat. Um, which is kind of fascinating. And the, the, um, so the 17 of Manos was actually um, in our latest ratings um, with mm -hmm. Venice. Um, I think it was one of Antonio's favorite wines. Yeah, outside of the 100 point um, black label, the Menos was the second highest scoring wine. And uh, the other note that I, that I remember from that was it was the only wine besides the Piera that was 100% cab. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, I think you get to a purity moment too, as you simplify the blend, stop, um, you know, as I've, I've become more confident as a winemaker between seven and 16 is a 10 year run. Um, and you become more confident, you um, pull back the curtain a little bit. And I think that the 16 shows off the sizzle of just being pure cap. Yeah. And I think there's something to be said for that. A lot of people are drinking 15 amendments right now. Oh. Obviously 16 is not, there, they don't have it. Um, yeah. Actually, we may. I uh, might have gone to a recent ship. I think I actually did sh ship some 16 amendments already. But most people have 15 in their cellars, and uh, Kelly was wondering mm -hmm. um, how similar the 15 is. 15 yeah. was to the 16. Yeah. So, um, good question, Kelly. Thank you. Um, as a as a as a winemaker, I tend to like the vintages that are prettier and more about poise and focus and freshness. Um, and I think most people um, prefer power and structure and depth. Um, in fact, I've, I've done some Zoom tastings with some different um, Trimble fans. And um, when, when we're sending wine out to people and I try to explain, well, what do you think people, you know, like people are sending out wine. It's kind of a cool idea, actually. We've had some, um, some customers send wine out to their extended family. And then we'll do a Zoom tasting with a whole bunch of people. Um, where we taste the wine with them. And so I try to like lead people to, I want people to have like, in most cases, people are trying to educate um, other generations or other members of their family about Turnbull and about wine in general. Um, and uh, humbled to, to think that we could be part of that. And as we've done that, I tried to like guide people to like make sure that the wine that we send out to people um, is something that they'll find palatable or interesting. And I, I guess I think that the like the fifteen minutes is is pretty in focus and has an amplitude and is more interesting and dynamic, and the sixteen minutes is more powerful and wide and potent, um, and it's kind of easier to love or easier to understand because mm -hmm. it's just like it's like watching a, a, a football game and seeing like some incredible linebacker like blocking out and you're like wow that's that's really impressive, um, whereas and it's easy to notice how how impressive that is. And the 16s are like that. Whereas the 15 is a little bit like watching like ballet. Mm -hmm. And unless you're like really in a ballet, you might not notice how like precise the on point is or something like that. So um, the 15s are, are um, a little bit more esoteric and prettier. I think they're more interesting ones. And the 16s are more um, just the nature of the vintage. Um, we don't, my job is not to like overshadow the vintage, it's to show off the best attributes of the vintage. And the, the 15 minute has prettiness and poise, and the 16 minute is power and drive. And so, if you're chasing a 15 of Menos right now, you're going to be seeing, seeing like the pretty side of a Menos, the, the poise and the structure, the, the lift and the focus. And the 16s are definitely like pushing the shoulders out a little bit more and blocking out a little heavier. So, um, they're both exciting wines, and they're, I, I think they're, there's not, it's not a better or worse thing. It's a, um, it's a um, different thing. It's like having two kids. I have two kids and many of you have many kids. Um, and um, my two kids are really different. Um, they have different skills. I love them both equally, right? They, they probably think I have favorites, but um, they're both different. And, um, you know, you don't, you, you consider them as having different attributes. And so um, the wines are like my kids too. And the 15 and 16, um, I love them both. Um, if I could take one of them out to dinner tonight, I'd probably take the 15. Um, unless I was going to go, unless I thought I was going to go have like a bad, bad, a burger or like maybe their, yeah. their, their, uh, bone and ribeye or something like that. 
um, or the pork chop over at Mustard, um, which is fantastic. Really good. Um, if I was going to have something with more weight on it, um, then I think the 16 would be an appropriate choice for that. If I, if I thought I might be having like the chicken Caesar salad, um, you know, or, um, or something like a little bit more dynamic that needed a little bit more nuance in the line, then I'd probably take the 15. Mm -hmm. I got a long one. You ready for a long question? I'm going to read it. Out. I'm going to read it because I, I don't want to summarize it because um, it's long. How much of a variance in barrel time is there from vintage to vintage when dealing with the same vineyard? Mm. Was the 07 in the barrel more or less the same compared to 2010? If so, why? Pete Ardito. Thank you, Pete Ardito. Um, hope you are well. Um, the... Um, Okay, barrel aging time. How long do we leave the wines in the barrels? It depends on the vintage. Um, that said, there's logistical reasons behind when we bottle wines too. So just like in anything in your life, there's balance between the choices you make. Um, there's um, when we're aging the wines, I'm tasting every barrel every month. So I've been like every week when we get on these things, I, I always like say I want 100 barrels in today or something. I've tasted a bunch of barrels and that's just like normal business practice. Um, my job is to like, make sure that all the barrels are taking along um, dutifully on their route to greatness, um, looking for outliers that need extra attention or looking for halo barrels that might, um, you know, might make Piera or might, might be important role players in the, the single vineyards or black label, um, you know, wines that, that um, you know, start sorting things in my brain. Um, and that during that tasting over, you know, I, I can't, I don't think that we've ever aged a red wine less than 18 months. And I don't think that we've ever aged a red wine more than 22 months. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, you know, that, that sounds maybe like a big difference, but it's not like, I guess I don't think of it as a big difference. And so like the difference why would you age one vintage 18 months and another one 22 months? Um, it might have to do with like what the wine means, like the 18 wines, um, the 2018s just didn't need yeah. as much barrel aging. Um, we've actually already bottled the 2018 Napa Cab. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably the best Napa Cab we've ever made. It's fantastic. And yeah. um, we bottled that um, three weeks ago. Right. Um, yes. So what was that? Um, we're, we're in April now. So that was bottled in like, let's say March. May. So that, yeah, that, March. That, was in, that was in barrel for 18 months. Um, and I think that that was, um, but I think when you taste that wine, you'll feel complete. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, if anything, it has, um, more power and density and layering than the 17, which was this award winning wine. Right. Um, and I've, I also, at the same time, I took all the reserve wines, the Oco Cab, the Black Label, Amanos, Fortuna, Leopoldina Cab, Bon Vivant, and this new secret blend. Um, and we've put them, we put them off the tank, made the blend. So I selected the individual barrels, barrel by barrel, um, even partial barrel by barrel, um, made the blends. And then we put those wines back in the barrels that they came from, because those barrels were performing at a level that allowed those individual lots to be the creme, the cream, you know, they, 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 they elevated. And so for whatever reason, those wines and those barrels were a perfect pair. And so if those wines are back in barrel, um, we'll actually do a topping uh, next week mm -hmm. on all those wines. Um, I just went through and tasted them all today. And um, those wines will disgorge again in early July, and then we'll bottle those in late July okay. um, and get ready for Sauvignon Blanc harvest in August. So um, that last sentence um, indicates that that process of the logistics of, of um, life. I need yeah. to get those barrels empty before the next vintage shows up. So I have a place to put the next vintage. Mm -hmm. And I can't empty them once the new grapes are coming in because I want my full focus and my, my team's full focus right. on making the new ones. So we need to like get those barrels empty by the end of July because Sauvignon Blanc is coming on our way sometime between August 10th and 20th. Um, and we're going to be all on that. So between that 18 month and 22 month kind of window, there's a logistical consideration. Yeah. yeah. That, you know, if, if it's yeah. doing really well on its own, bring after it. 18 months, bring it. And then yeah. after, you know, maybe if we have the luxury yeah. of time on our hands. And yeah. Can, so like less, yeah, like less than 18 months would have been like, well, we were busy making the, the rosé and the Josephine. Um, and so our focus, you know, it's a little bit like um, the eye is focused on that. And then, 
boom over here. Um, and so, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, if, if something about that wasn't right and that wasn't a quality move, then we changed that idiom. But in the 20 years I've been making wine, the, that, 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 the, the late spring to late summer of the year, um, you know, 18 months to 22 months after harvest, that's, that's the window. And it, it, it Turnbull's not alone in that. Most um, most wineries in that valley are bottling in the same. Do you um, have a, a big memory of these three? How long they were? Um, I you know I I typically um, I just say that everything's aged twenty months. I just like slice it right out of the middle, keep the 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 story um, consistent. Um, and I think that that there's not really a statistical difference to me between eighteen and twenty two months. To me, it's um, it, we bottled it appropriately, so I, I really don't know when we bottled. I could go back and look in the notes, but it, to me, it's like that's not it's not necessarily a story. It's about getting it right for the wine and also staying in line to be ready for the future. So we're we're we can't focus always on the trees. We have to focus on the total forest and the forest that's coming my way is the the harvest that's coming down on my neck. Um, this I mean, this is we're almost in June. Um, so I've got, you know, I've got three months to get ready for harvest. Um, the world keeps spinning around the sun and, uh, we've got another harvest coming. So even though, um, we've got this crazy world that we live in, um, mother nature is, um, pushing right ahead with the future. Yeah. And, um, my job is to be ready for that, to make the beautiful wines that someone's going to enjoy 10 years from now. Yeah. So thank you, Peter. Tom, do you have any more questions? I don't. I have a couple questions. questions. Um, well, just kind of going off that note, yeah. so the vintage coming up, mm -hmm. 2020. Mm -hmm. How is that looking right now? Uh, 2020 is looking exciting. Um, the berries are this big. They're very, very small. Tom has is, Tom is made a point in his fingers that's, that's like microscopic. We have a lot of little peas. Those are actually flowers, Tom. Oh, yeah. I know yeah. we were growing peas. No. Um, so bloom hasn't happened yet, so Tom's dreaming about berries. but. Um, Bloom is it about um, in some of our early blocks like Merlot, Cap Franc, we might have like one percent um, bloom where a flower has popped open, but it's pretty much not happened yet. Um, we had rainy, cold weather for the last week. Um, we had a couple, like two inches of rain in Calistoga and about an inch in Oakville, um, and so um, this week is warming up, and by next week we should have some pretty substantial bloom. We'll be at like maybe twenty-five percent bloom. Weather looks like clean and crisp and uh, should be good bloom weather. Um, bloom is where these little flowers open up. Um, it's not hummingbirds and bees. Um, pollen blows around and sets sets that flower into a piece of fruit. Um, so each individual grape, we call them berries. I was telling somebody that those were berries, like grapes were berries. Yeah. And they're like, no, no, no. Berries are strawberries, or all berries, blueberries. Like, those are not berries. And I was like, no, they're, they're berries. Um, you know, the banana is an herb. Um, you know, like these are funny yeah. words, but it's a berry. So um, don't mean to confuse with the word berry, but the grapes, are, we call them berries. And so um, the um, it's too early to tell what the 2020 vintage is going to do. Um, we had a fairly dry winter, about like half normal rains, like the 2007 vintage. And then we've had kind of a tumultuous early spring. We've had two extra inches of rain in May, which... You know, I don't know if that's the new normal or what's going on, um, but it's um, it, that's been helpful actually in that we had a dry winter and it's gotten us more um, canopy growth. To that, that's going to make the sun canopy that's going to shade our fruit later in the season. Um, we've got good shoot elongation. Um, the, the, the bloom clusters look really long, mm -hmm. um, but there's not as many of them. So I guess I'm thinking we're going to have like my gut appeal our gut um, appreciation of this is that we're going to have a smaller cluster count. Mm -hmm. Clusters per vine are going to be lower, but the clusters are going to be bigger. Interesting. Um, but what, uh, you know, we don't like tend to take a lot of uh, credence in anything until, you know, it's like counting your chickens before they hatch. Right. Um, we tend to like wait until we pick and then we know what we're looking at. Um, um, you know, we're walking vineyards and tasting fruit once it's fruit. Um, well, once it's fruit, it's, it tastes like something. Um, and so, um, it's truly to say, I guess I, I have kind of a good feeling about it. I feel like, um, things balance out, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, in, um, I guess I, I think that this will be a good finish. Okay. 
I usually like um, our uh, general manager, Toby, who's so awesome. She's um, probably watching and um, she would, she would tell you that I'm a, I'm a whiner, uh, uh, you know, I'm a, a chicken little. I'll, I'll say the sky's falling. The vintage is going to be terrible. Um, you know, and always alarm bells. And part of my job is to like give uh, forewarning of uh, troubles for the business, let's say. Um, so I tend to be um, pretty um, careful about my expectations or my deliverance of expectations. Um, You're like Scotty on Star Trek. I'm like Scotty on Star Trek. Um, and the, um, I guess I, 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 I don't know. I have a good feeling about it. Don't tell Toby. Um, She's barely commenting. So Good. She probably is a watch. Good. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, I, I I I don't know. My personal feeling is I have a good feeling about it. I think it'll be a good year, um, which is remarkable because the 17 minutes was amazing. You know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. It's been great. We've had a great run. Really good run. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, uh, we actually can take it back to 12. I guess um, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Have been phenomenal. Eleven was total shit. Um, we did a great job because we we took a chance out through the cellar and and sold off eighty percent of the wine. Thank you, Odell family. Um, and that that was a great idea and uh, allowed us to focus on only wines that we'd have on our own family table. Um, you know, so by that math, then I'd say, like, ooh, it's sketchy. That seems like twenty couldn't possibly be good. But you know, go back to that statistical puzzle of like, you know, flicking a coin. Just because you've gotten heads 10 times in a row doesn't mean you're not going to get heads again. The past results don't implicate what the future result will be mm -hmm. um, in this case. So like that we've had um, a good run doesn't mean that we'll have a bad a bad take out of this year. Yeah. Um, the odds are 50-50. We've had a good run, but um, that that Mother Nature doesn't know she's given us, uh, given us uh, spades um, for what, nine years in a row or something like that. So I'm, I'm hoping we get spades again. Um, another question I had was, um, so we've got a single vineyard wine, and we'll probably get into this maybe more next week's barrel tasting, but, you know, you're very decisive in the coopers that we use, yeah. and do you find that the Aminas vineyard calls for certain barrels or certain toast levels from super, mm -hmm. certain cooperages, maybe more so than other vineyards? It's a good question. I should probably pay more attention to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's been working out so far. Um, but, um, so, okay, this is kind of crazy, but when we order barrels, so I've already ordered our barrels for this vintage and I've actually ordered them like two months ago. Mm -hmm. Actually, our, our, our favorite Cooper has, has alerted me that our barrels, um, are on the water. So they're, they've been okay. loaded in a container and they're on our way and we'll have them in time for harvest. And with the, the COVID-19 thing, the French Cooperages are, have had, you know, France has been hard hit by the, the virus. Um, and although McCorn has done a great job there and um, they, they're taking reasonable precautions, um, you know, ports and containers. Um, it's kind of funny. There's a whole global chain of uh, containers that come from China that bring goods to not just America, but to France. And those empty containers then um, ferry goods back. So like the, the, the Samsung TVs that might show up in France, those containers get reloaded with French barrels that then show back up in America. And then the empty container... In America, gets loaded with like our recyclables or something, and, and, and ends up back up in China. But that 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 system's broken um, because we're not buying so many TVs, right? Or the French aren't, or whatever. However, that works. And so there's not been enough containers to actually move the barrels from France to America. And you'd be surprised in France, Italy, Spain, uh, great and historical grape growing and winemaking regions. But half of the French oak barrels are sold and bought by American wineries half and so um it's a big deal um and so like you know coopers i mean you know just like in the, your business um you're not sure about what your business is doing due to this crazy time and um the the cooperages are also you know aggressively looking for sales um but many of them are like emailing me all the time um maybe even many of them i don't buy barrels from um, and saying, you know, we're, we're just not sure if we can get the barrels to you in time because of this container thing. Um, mm -hmm. So the good news is we, I, I'm pragmatic. I know what I want. Um, and uh, Turnbull's great and uh, funded the barrel purchases early. 
Um, and so we've purchased all our barrels. Um, they're on the water. They're coming our way. Uh, but when I buy those barrels, um, I don't know what the vintage is going to be like at all. Um, we haven't even, like, bud break is starting to think about happening, but we don't even know what the bloom cluster is going to look like or the weather pattern for the summer or harvest weather or anything. We have no idea. And so it's important to, like, buy um, a broad um, palette of different barrels, uh, different toasting levels, different forests, different makers, so that you have the tools to deal with whatever might come your way. Mm -hmm. And so um, that said, I've, I've, I've um, you know, because of COVID-19, um, and we want to be more cautious, um, we always want to over-deliver in your bottle. And so um, because the economy is unknown, um, we've been more careful this year also. So I took my barrel purchasing and tightened it mm -hmm. just to the ones that have historically shown the best. Normally, we would do a barrel trial where we're trying new things. Uh, this year, we took a pause on that um, to try to um, both protect your investment in Turnbull's wines and our own. Um, that more focused um, approach to the barrel buying this year um, should be a good thing, um, and that we won't have barrels that we tried that we didn't like. If you don't, if you know you're going to like it, then it's not a trial. Um, and that more focused approach. Um, has barrels coming our way, and um, once I taste the grapes, I start conceiving which barrels would be better with that, and then as they're fermenting, I start tasting those lots. We're still on skins. I'm tasting a couple times a day. They're pressing the wines. Um, we have the, the fresh wines um, in tank, and we're going to barrel them down. Um, I'm tasting then, and that's kind of like probably the most important tasting. And, and so there's not one perfect barrel. There's not a barrel that's like great for everything. There's barrels that power and densify and give more um, structure and opulence to a wine. And there's barrels that are restrained and like hold the wine together and give it lift and focus. There's like kind of two different worlds of barrels. Um, there's, a, there's the, you know, the barrels that are in the middle are kind of okay at both, but they're not really good at either. Um, and so we buy barrels from like two despair worlds, all French. Um, but um, they're useful in different ways. So it kind of simplifies my puzzle. When, we, yeah. when I'm tasting the wines that are coming out of the fermenters, um, it's pretty evident whether it wants, like, does that wine need more help? Um, does, it want, it, does it have fruit opulence and density? Um, and it's impossible, like, it's so opulent and fruit dense that if I put a pretty barrel on it, the, fruit, the pretty barrel will just, like, fade away in the background. Um, then I put a power barrel on that to, like, take that fruit opulence and like make it bigger and darker and more powerful. And do I have a lot that's like shy and pretty and red and maybe has like elegant notes of spices or uh, ethereal notes. Then I take like the, the barrels that, that create that, that accentuate and harmonize and don't overpower prettiness. Mm -hmm. And I'd use that barrel. Um, and then we end up with like two very disparate voices in, in the cellar. So when those like those then ride for 18 months, um, if something's not working, I can always like switch barrels around so I can rack something out, put it in a different barrel, um, make those choices. Um, hopefully I've made a good choice initially and you don't need to make um, corrective moves, but you, you could. Um, and amongst that, and eventually like the pretty barrels that are about focus and lift, those tend to be in our vineyard decimates. And the power barrels, they tend to be all about black label. Mm. Um, and so those, those two voices, and then um, there, there's, you know, the pretty barrels that are a little bit more broad and less pretty tend to fill in Oco Reserve. And the power barrels that would have made black label but don't quite hit that crescendo, mm -hmm. they tend to be in our Napa Valley Cabernet. I think it's interesting you're describing these barrels as you would a wine. And when I first started learning about wine, yeah. And if you go home watching, I don't think we always realize wood barrels, just if we talk about grape terroir or terroir, as someone corrected me last night on the phone, because really? I didn't to pronounce it correctly. Yeah. Um, wood is the same way. Yeah, Trees, forests grow in different humidity levels, different types of soil, different, uh, what's the word, uh, vertical rates. Yeah. That's the word I'm looking for. Growth rate. Growth rate, yes. Um, bring the, the, the density of the wood. 
that's you that that all, that all changes, and then you add toasting into that. That's a whole another layer layer of yeah. the greater terroir, terroir, uh, if you will. And I think it's really interesting because you could have a barrel coming from the north of France versus a little very metal, and it will be very different. Yeah. If you can even toast the same way; it will still have a different effect on the wine uh, from grapes from the same thing you're blocking. I just that's the part of wine making that I think we just for someone like me who knows very little compared to you, I find it really interesting. Yeah. And I think people at home watching, just when you think of it that way, it really does change the way you appreciate the work. We're right at an hour, but we have I wanted we have one question, two yeah. questions I'm gonna combine real quick. Maybe we can address. Um, are your toast levels consistent that when you order mm -hmm. year to year? And um, have we ever used American oak, and why don't we use American oak? Yes. Um, okay, I'll tackle the easier toasting question first. Um, toast level is consistent. Um, over time, I have diminished the amount of toasting that we use. When I arrived at Turnbull, we would do um, medium plus or medium long. And um, in recent years, I've done medium and medium minus. Um, and so, but what one cooper might call medium, another cooper would call medium plus. So just like getting a, a ribeye steak at three different restaurants, uh, you could order, um, you know, blaze hell or, um, you know, um, you know, medium, medium well, um, and they could be the same thing uh, in different places. Women's jeans yeah. sizes in different stores. Yeah. Like Cafe are not the same. Right. And so um, <laughs> coast, it's mostly about knowing what the cooper that you work with, what they consider to be that name for their toasting. Um, but in general, over time, um, I've used, I've like shied back from toastiness and uh, let the fruit do more of the work. Um, the, um, and the question about American oak, when I arrived at Turnbull in 2007, uh, Turnbull actually made a uh, like kind of a pizza night red called Old Bull, um, which um, I don't think we've made since 2010 maybe. Um, it was a really great wine. It was so good that, um, but it was a total money loser. Um, so the, the, um, at the time, and I'm a champion of different heirloom grape varieties, but we had Sangratillo and Zimbabwe and San Giovese and Barbera um, and different um, different grape varieties, and they were kind of right next to Cabernet Rose that go perennially in the black label. Mm -hmm. um, but when the San Giovese was like super good, um, it would become a bottle of San Giovese that was $25. Mm -hmm. um, and when it wasn't good, it would go into something called Old Bull, which was like $18. Um, and my job as winemaker is to make sure that we're remunerating the effort of the team um, and of the ownership and respecting the property and the terroir. And if we turn a lot, and, and those wines um, massively lost money. So if we're losing money on that, then we're overcharging you for other wines because we're, we're having to subsidize those ones. And the old bowl um, was unfortunately, a, you know, although it was a fan favorite because it was a nice pizza night red, um, it was grown right next door to terroir that was making, you know, very impressive and important wines. Um, and it was under delivering. So we retool those vineyard blocks. That's why we have Malbec and Petit Gros, Cabernet Franc and Merlot at our different vineyard sites now. Um, and that allows us to make our vineyard designates and black label better. Um, but in an effort while I was unable to, um, not make that wine anymore, um, because it was still something that, that we wanted to, um, when the Odell family bought the Turnbull Winery, um, they made a promise to William Turnbull um, that they would keep the family crest alive and well on the label of the bottle. And I think that that's an honorable and, and wise decision. Um, and I might be speaking out of turn, but that's my understanding of how that went down. And so the, um, the Turnbull family crest was, was in, in, um, emblazoned on the Old Bull bottle. And today you'll find it actually, if you have the bottle, there's a watermark on the label. And there's a, there's the old um, Adachi Fava Fortuna um, family crest is hidden, if you will. It's embossed. Uh, embossed on the label. Yeah. And so we honor that tradition there. Um, and that allows us to not make the label anymore, which is um, also nice as a winemaker. Um, it was difficult to convince people that the wines were serious when we made a $18 um, Tuesday night wine. Um, when we were making that wine, 
I was um, interested in making sure that we were making that wine and not, and I was trying to figure out how we could make that wine and not lose money at that wine, um, which has turned out to be impossible. We could have used like sticks and chips and liquid oak um, to make that wine and we would have still lost money. So pennies on the dollar versus like, you know, hundreds of dollars um, uh, for, for, for a real barrel um, per case kind of thing. Um, and it, so I did trial American oak and Hungarian oak um, on that wine in 2007, eight and nine, I think. And um, there are some good American oak and Eastern European oak um, products that, that are suitable for that range of wines. Um, but the, um, and the, the, all those cooperages are owned by the French anyways, um, the, the technical expertise, the equipment, all that stuff, the American cooperages, it's not like we're buying American, like keeping it real for America. It's, it's, um, it's an international business. It's an expensive business. The equipment is very expensive and the access to wood and all that stuff. The reason that French oak is uh, superior to the other oaks is um, the, the, the European oak species are a different species than American oak. And American oak is allowed to be cut at any time of the year. Um, it's sappier um, and it's, it it's, uh, can be coarse on and the sap closes up the phloem or the tubules that move the sap through the wood. And so when you cut across the grain, you end up with end grain that touches the wine. And because of that sap closing up those pores, the wine doesn't seep out of the barrel, which is nice. Um, but the wine penetrates the wood about 10 millimeters. And with French oak, um, it, it's all uh, pneumatically split um, on the grain. There's less end grain touching the wine. There's a few grains that are broken in that process, but mostly you have um, parallel grain to the surface of the wine. The wine penetrates the oak several millimeters, not 10, mm -hmm. um, and you have less oak impact. So the French oak barrel is more um, gentle on the wine, let's say, the, it becomes less of a story of the wine. So if you if you like um, a wine that has a substantial oak preference, um, Silver Oak is famous for their American oak usage. And that would be an interesting experiment. You can taste Silver Oak next to Turnbull and I think you'll you'll see the difference. Um, the um, There's about 10% of French oak is actually not from France. It comes from Eastern European um, oak forest forest and um, if you have a really beautiful tree that has tight grain and um, was well well protected and limbed and, and forested for 200 years and you've harvested that you uh, slide it across the forest across the border in France and it becomes French oak so um, if you're buying French oak you pay a premium but um, if the money is well spent um, the Eastern European oak being the same species the Eastern European oak forests were not uh, managed for 200 continuous years by people that care about the forest Mm -hmm. um, they were under a system of communism that, that uh, didn't really remunerate people for doing any hard work. Um, and those forests were shattered by you know, shrapnel and different war effects over the years. So the Eastern European oak it tends to be um, less consistent and uh, looser grain. And if, they, if there is a good piece of wood that came out of that, um, the top edge of that um, goes into French oak barrels. So, um, that's why we use French oak, and it's all about quality first. Cool. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in for week eight of our virtual tastings. Um, we will see you next week, uh, same time, same place. Yeah. Uh, we're doing barrel tasting. Another just. How are people? What What should people open for barrel tasting? I a barrel. Open any term? Yeah. Okay. So if you have a, one of those little mini barrels of tequila, you're gonna want to hit that. I think any bottle of term will be will be good. Um, I think we'll probably touch upon lots of different things you're tasting in your glass. Um, maybe a bottle of red wine. Just, just put it out there. Preferably from From Turnbull. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, we hope you sharing maybe some good news soon about reopening. I don't know. It's just been long on my mind. Um, I think it's going to be in two, time, two weeks. We are putting out a song to say thank you to everyone who's working on the front lines right now. It's a little cheesy, but we're going to do it. But we're cheesy. Oh, yeah. So, and happy Memorial Day weekend. Um, Carrie has picked out um, David Bowie Heroes. Is that right, Carrie? Yes. So we've got um, Heroes from David Bowie. Um, I think it's a nice choice, Carrie. Thank you for selecting that. Uh, you got to switch the phone up. Second button from the right hand. There we go. Okay. Cue it up. Carrie's going to cue it up.
Carrie's uh, working on her retail skills. The good news is Carrie is like an exceptional um, marketing manager that's done such a great job through this whole thing. And here we go. Heroes by David Bowie. Oh, He's working on DJ skills. Thanks, Carrie. I'm not going to 